Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. This evening we are coming to the last of the parables recorded for us in that chapter. I'm once again going to read the whole chapter for us. Matthew chapter 13 from verse 1. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what, he, what has been sown in his heart. This it is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come to make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowd in parables, Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. 
Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understand, understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Only so far the word of the Lord. May he bless the reading of his word. <coughs> now this evening we come to the parable of the net, of the dragnet, from verses 47 up until verse 50. Let me read that again. It is in the succession of a couple of parables being told, and again Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now in this parable this evening, we find some of the themes continuing on from the other parables that we have dealt with before. Think of the comparison between the parable of the net and the parable of the wheat and the weeds. We also find the theme of judgment in both of those parables, where um, the wheat and the weed are gathered in, the weeds are burned up, and there's also weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Another striking um, a striking fact about this parable is that there's an explanation at the end of this parable, a very short explanation, not like the exposition that Christ gives for the parable of the sower or the parable of the wheat and the weeds, but a very short explanation of what's going on here. Another thing to note is that this parable follows on from what we did last Sunday, where we saw the value of the kingdom, but also the cost of discipleship. And so this parable then comes at the end where Jesus is saying, again, the kingdom of heaven is like. He's comparing the kingdom of heaven to something. And as we've seen with these parables where Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like, we've used the example of a projector with those clear plastics that you write on. And so you overlay one truth over the next, over the next. And if I can recap, the first parable was about the word of the kingdom preached to an individual and that word finding a place in the understanding and in the heart of the person hearing it and then bearing fruit. But also about the enemy, Satan, the world and the, and the flesh that attack the word that is sown in the heart and that you'll find in the explanation verses 18 to 23. Then we come to the parable of the wheat and the weeds showing that as you look at the world around you and as you know the kingdom of the Lord has come, the disciples in this, or the servants in this parable wondering, they ask the question to the master in verse 27, how then does it have weeds? 
They're asking him, did you not sow good seed in your field? And so when the word of the kingdom comes and that word is sown and there's weeds that come up, the servants wonder. And it's the same as what John had wondered when he was in jail. Lord, are you really the one? Is this really your kingdom? Haven't you sown good seed? Isn't this the kingdom that was supposed to come and now we find evil in the world still? And so the parable is an answer to that. That the two will grow together until the close of the age. And then Jesus will come back and judge. And he'll have his servants. And what was interesting to note was that in agricultural practice there's one thing. The weeds would be left in the field. But what we find is that the weeds are gathered in first and burned in the furnace and in the fire. And it's the same thing we find in this parable with the dragnet. The fish, that, the bad fish being thrown out. So we find that same pattern. Continuing on from that, we found the value, or firstly the growth of the kingdom in the parables of the mustard seed and of the leaven. And we also saw that the, that the growth of the kingdom is twofold. It's a growth on the outside with the mustard seed, a growth in society and in the world outside, how this kingdom will grow into a great and large tree making home for all the garden plants. But also it's an inward growth. A parable of the leaven that's hidden but making all leaven. And then last week we had a look at the value of the kingdom. The parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great value. And we saw the value and the worth of the kingdom is a cost not that you have to ask yourself, can I afford the kingdom of heaven? But can I afford not to pay the price for the kingdom of heaven? For this is of great value. And we don't know what this treasure is or had this treasure described to us. But we have an inkling of what this treasure is worth by the resolve of the man who found this treasure to obtain that treasure. And so the one parable about the luckiness or the, the, um, the wonder at finding a hidden treasure. We said it was like winning the lottery in those days if you would come across a treasure. Um, but also the parable that goes hand in hand with that is the pearl of great value. Just to, um, to invite you to be searching for this pearl. It's not something that you think, oh, I wish I'm lucky enough to get the kingdom of heaven. It's something that you need to actively search for. And that's why we have these parables back to back. And now, with this parable of the net, we ask what lesson is there to learn about the kingdom in this parable? And the first thing that we find is that it's an image that comes from the Old Testament. This image of the dragnet or fish Coming up is an image that's uh, prevalent in the Old Testament. And I'll take us to a couple of Old Testament passages um, to show where we find this imagery and the context in which we find it so that we can make proper conclusions about the teaching of Jesus in this passage. Turn in your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 1. I think Habakkuk chapter... Habakkuk, the whole book of Habakkuk, all four chapters are a, a good um, scripture reading uh, for us to do in this time. Specifically with the things going on in this world around us. It's a great comfort um, to know uh, the, the kind of things that Habakkuk had faced in his own day. And it's, much, it's very similar to the things that we face in our own day. Not just in our country, but worldwide. So the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk complains in chapter 1 to the Lord. He says, O Lord, verse 2, How long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry out to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. That sounds much like the same difficulties that we face. Anyway, the Lord answers from verse 5. Look 
among the nations and see. Wonder and be astonished, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their face, faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, and they pile up earth and take it. And they sweep by the like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. And so this is the Lord's answer. He is raising up an enemy for Israel, but it's his work. And so Habakkuk complains again, verse 12, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly, idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and make offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? And so here we have the image of a dragnet, of fish being pulled out of the sea. By God's instrument, the Chaldeans. And so two truths are simultaneously true here. God will use the Chaldeans to judge his people it's for his righteous judgment. And the Chaldeans, as the instrument in God's hand, are also doing this to their own destruction. They also are judged in the way in which they are used for this judgment. For look at what Habakkuk says, verse 16. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offering to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. The Lord enables the Chaldeans to prosper and to have this power and this might. And he will use the Chaldeans to judge his people. For they have forsaken the Lord. But the Chaldeans think that this power comes from themselves. They do not recognize that they are instruments in God's hand. And so they worship their instruments. They make offerings and they sacrifice to their idols. And their idols here are the work of their own hand. Therefore he sacrifices to his net. And makes offerings to his dragnet. Another image in the same vein. Jeremiah chapter 16. Where we find the Lord's judgment. And the Lord's judgment is always restorative judgment for his people. For the end of the book of Habakkuk. Just to ease your mind. The Lord comforts his people. And his people worship him. Remember the words of Habakkuk at the end of that book. Even though I am in the most hopeless of situations. We even sing that song. where um, Even though the fig tree will not uh, have fruit. Or the vine will not have fruit. And everything is desolate. Yet I will sing praises to the Lord. And so that's the end of that book. There's a restorative aspect to God's judgment for his people. And this is what we find in Jeremiah chapter 16. Verse 14, therefore behold the days are coming declares the Lord when it shall no longer be said as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them. For I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. Behold I am sending for many fishers declare the Lord and they shall catch them. And afterward I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks, for my eyes are on their ways. They are not hidden from me, 
nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes, but first I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land with the carcasses of their detestable idols, and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. O Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth, and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but lies, worthless, worthless things, in which there is no profit. Can man make for himself gods? Such are not gods. Therefore, behold, I will make them know, this once I will make them know, my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. And so here God is prophesying that he will take his people into the land of the enemy, into the country of the north, but he will also lead them out from that country, and he uses the imagery of fishers and of hunters. What is the imagery used when Jesus calls his disciples at the beginning of his ministry? Turn for that to Matthew chapter, thir- uh, Matthew chapter 5, four, 4 and 5. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. You see, God was promising to lead his people back to their country after he has dealt with them, after he has reproved them and corrected them. And here is his call to the disciples, verse 18. While walking by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. And so this is the calling with which Jesus has called the disciples, is to participate in that mission of bringing God's people back to him. That's the restoration of Israel. That's God's restorative power To restore his people to their place. Remember the land that he had promised them also came hand in hand with the kingdom. And so when Jesus is telling this parable in chapter 13 of Matthew. That the kingdom of heaven is like a net. He's recalling imagery of judgment. And of restoration. But it's not just that this net was cast into the sea, but that the net will be cast into the sea. For we see again the kingdom of heaven, verse 47, is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be. So here is the kingdom. The kingdom brings with it a promise of judgment to come. A visitation from the Lord. A net that will be cast into the sea. The sea of this world. If you take that imagery and catch every kind of person, every kind of man. From every tribe and tongue and nation and language group. I believe that is what is meant by every kind of fish. And when that net is full, when the time is full, when the time is complete, when the kingdom has grown to its full capacity in this time, that is when it will be drawn ashore. And then there will be a sorting out. The good into containers, throwing away of the bad. And what we find here is that this judgment and this day of visitation is instituted by the king himself. It's not just something that happens um, because of the nature of things. It's a day that is specifically prepared for Christ to come and return and for this sorting out to take place as we have read in the parable of the wheat and the weeds. When the master of the field sends out the harvesters, he holds off his servants when they want to go in and start the harvest or uproot the weeds. But the king says... No, wait until all is complete. And so again we find at the close of the age, verse 49, 
the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so back to back with the value that we've heard of last week, the value and the cost of entering that kingdom, we find also the warning of not being part of that kingdom, of not taking heed to the words of Christ. There is inexplicable joy coming with the kingdom. There is inexplicable value that comes with the kingdom, but there's also great and terrible things awaiting those who do not purchase this field or purchase that pearl of great value. And so what I've said last week rings true even this week. Can you afford not to pay the price for the kingdom? Can you afford not to pay the price for the kingdom? For in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And as we saw in our passage in Jeremiah, where the Lord will pay His people back double for their iniquity, that paying back double for their iniquity, that punishment, that suffering that He has put upon them to restore them, is not as bad as being in this place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's worse to be completely cut off by the Lord than to suffer under His hand the discipline Now, how do I draw this back to the church then? What does this mean for you and for me? Well, in our day and age, we can also compare the church, like in Jeremiah's day, Israel, being captive, taken captive by the enemy. In today's world where we live, we can also see the church in various areas taken captive by the world. Sometimes when you come to church meetings or look at people who claim to be Christians, You cannot see the difference between a Christian and a person living in the world. For a Christian loves his stuff, his things, his car, his house, his job, his position. He likes the movies. He likes the things of the world and the things that this world has to offer. And so for a time being, the Lord has allowed his people to be caught up in these things. But he will punish And he will discipline his children. And remember his punishment is not to cast them away finally. But to bring them and lead them back to his church. And so this then is the hope that you and I have. And the prayers that you and I should have for the Lord's church. When we see these things not to become despondent, depressed or think that all is lost. But to fervently pray. That the Lord would call his people back and bring them back by the suffering that they will face. For they will inevitably face suffering in the world. And that they would realize in forsaking the Lord, the suffering that that brings about is worse than the suffering that they are facing in this world. The little bit of suffering that the Lord asks you to take up for his namesake and for the sake of his kingdom is a light momentary affliction in the words of Paul. My yoke is light and my burden is light. The call of the Lord Jesus himself. Let us consider in taking up that burden ourselves and let us consider praying. Let us take up those prayers and pray for those who have heard the word of the kingdom and are hearing the word of the kingdom that they would listen and that we would listen, that we would tune our ears to this whispering of Jesus in this teaching in the parables. May the Lord help us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world to declare boldly, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We have heard his call and his message. We pray that that word of the kingdom will find entrance into our hearts and that we would bear much fruit for the kingdom. 
that we would listen and tune our ears and our hearts to the parables of Jesus, learning the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. We pray that your church will experience the result of knowing the secret and knowing these hidden things and that we would live them out. That we would live in the reality of people who are of that kingdom, Lord. Lord, and we will inevitably encounter people who are opposed to this kingdom or blind to this kingdom. I pray, Lord, that as we encounter such, that we would seek your face and your help in dealing with the men of this world. Help us to discern who are our enemies and who are our friends. I pray also, Lord, that your word, your gospel, will go out into the world and call men to repentance. And that men might heed that call as long as we have the opportunity, as long as you give men the opportunity for today. For we know that you will at one point summon the reapers. You will summon your angels and you will gather the men of this world from every corner of this world and there is no escaping your judgment. And Lord, when your people stand before your judgment seat, we look forward to the grace and the mercy that we would receive because of the name of Christ Jesus and because of the work that he had done on our behalf. Let us with fear and trembling approach you on that day. Ready our hearts and our minds for the things to come. And let us know, O Lord, that you are a God who provides for us every day. You sustain us by the daily bread that we receive from your hand to do just that which you have called us for today. And let us not worry about the things of tomorrow or the things of the future, but let us be ready for when you call us to action, O Lord. We ask that you keep us safe in your congregation, in your church, as a fellowship, that we would cling to Christ and the body of Christ and that we would be earnest in our worship of you, not just our private and personal worship, Lord, but our corporate worship. For you have called us, not just as an individual worshiping you, but as a church, as a people together, as a fellowship, as your household. We pray that we might be found as worshiping servants when Christ would return. We pray that you keep us and hold us in your hand. In Jesus' name, amen.